Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. We certainly are very excited to be here. So today, we're going to be talking about empowering game development. But before we start, a brief introduction of who we are. Uh, myself, I'm Michael Penta. I'm an art director at Behavior Interactive and a course lecturer at uh, Université de Québec à Chicoutimi, or NAD. And I am Nicolas Leclerc. I am an art technical lead uh, at Behavior Interactive, where I mostly program tools and deploy them to our artists. Yeah. So who we are, Behavior Interactive, we were founded in Quebec in 1992. We are Canada's largest independent game developer. You might know us by our flagship game, Dead by Daylight, which has been around for quite some time. And we also have studios located around the world. So last year was Michael and I's first Bender conference, and we had such an amazing time that it was very clear to us that we wanted to come back this year. It's actually the first thing that we asked for when we came back to the office. So, um, yeah, not only were the talks uh, really good, but we also had so many interesting conversations with in engaging individuals around the floor uh, that really helped us make informed decisions and helped shape the approach that we took to integrating Blender in the company. Um, by being here, uh, representing behavior, we also hope that we'll inspire other video game studios to come to the conference and talk about their own Blender experience. So this talk, we're mainly going to focus around two main aspects. So from my portion, the art and community and how we got a community going and how we got Blender into the hands of the artists. And on my side, I'll be talking about the technical integration of Blender into our pipeline. So uh, the three main points I'll be going over today is how we built engagement within the studio and with all the individuals. Secondly, how we started to integrate our pipelines and the trainings we did for all of that. And lastly, the future and where we intend to go with Blender within the studio. But before I get into all of this, a little bit of uh, story time, if I might. Uh, when I started at the studio about six years ago, uh, I was already an avid Blender user. And my first project when I started was Meet Your Maker. And so what I wanted to do was try to bring uh, Blender into the actual pipeline of uh, behavior. And so I was allowed to do so. And so we decided to start with a very small focus group of individuals. So in this case, the environment, our team on Meet Your Maker. Um, and nonetheless, the results were very promising. It went very well. The production went along very smoothly. And so to us and the studio, this was a success. And so from this point on, um, we decided how can we expand this vision across the entire studio. Before so, uh, just a couple of examples of the different biomes that we did for Meteor Maker, all of which were made in Blender. So um, when we were building engagement in the studio, the first thing that we had to come to terms with was what was our communication standpoint? What did we want to communicate to the individuals in the studio? And what was our standpoint as a studio? And so what we wanted to do was to promote Blender as an additional tool in the artist's tool set, and not something that we're going to force onto people. It's not going to replace anything. It's more when and where the individual wants to use it. Um, some of the first steps we did was establishing some internal channels. We used Teams. And so in Teams, we created our own dedicated Teams channel. And this allowed uh, individuals who were already using Blender to start sharing their knowledge amongst each other, showcasing their work, whether it's personal work or uh, professional work on the projects they were already working on, uh, and support and troubleshooting. So if anyone had problems, we had a place to go to to talk to internally amongst ourselves to help each other. And of course, every time there's new add-ons, new versions, updates, resources, anything, we had a place to share it amongst ourselves. So this was our first step in trying to build a community within the studio of people who use Blender. Uh, from there, we decided to form a core group of Blender users, uh, what we called the Blender experts. And uh, these were individuals who were very, already quite avid in using Blender within the studio. This allowed for a much more engaged peer support and people who we could actually turn to who had much more knowledge than the average person in the studio. It allowed these individuals to also share their knowledge and what they were doing within the studio and how they were integrating it into their pipelines. And we created a nice feedback loop within these, this Teams channel and you know, um, good communication amongst everybody. And we wanted to start bringing a nice cultural impact within the studio. We wanted individuals to start talking about Blender organically and trying to you know, build the hype within the studio of wanting to change or wanting to try something new. Um, and from there on, we decided to start developing some uh, discipline-specific trainings um, with very specific tailored learning paths. The idea here was to have very flexible formats where we would not do back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back trainings. The idea was to leave time in between each of the trainings so each of these individuals or disciplines could have time and go and practice and experiment and then come back to the next training with already some built-up knowledge of Blender and how to use it. Um, and again, encouraging the experimentation, encouraging individuals to want to use Blender across the studio. 
So when it came to art pipelines, the general integration strategy that we had decided to go with was to start with what we called rare users. So individuals who didn't necessarily use 3D softwares on a daily basis, but what it allowed us to do is have a small focus group of individuals who are actively using Blender in production. This consisted mostly of directors, team leads, and our VFX teams. Uh, these were individuals who would open up uh, 3D softwares to um, validate work and such. Um, and the idea here, like I said, was to build a small base of individuals so we could have some kind of knowledge of how it actually is going in a, a development process. And then so we can have some results to gauge. And as I mentioned, unsurprisingly, individuals who didn't use 3D softwares very frequently continued to not use 3D softwares very frequently. So we didn't really have a very large knowledge base. But nonetheless, everything went smoothly, so it allowed us to kind of transition into the next step, which was our concept artists. Um, and so quite surprisingly, or unsurprisingly, um, a lot of our concept artists were already using 3D softwares in their pipeline. And again, not surprisingly, uh, a lot of them were already using Blender in their pipelines while they were working. Um, so in this case, uh, Nicolas Coté, one of the concept artists at uh, Behavior Interactive, um, worked on this uh, Assassin's Guard for Meet Your Maker. Um, and so in this case, they wanted to, he did a quick 2D sketch with the weapon and the character, and he goes, I, I really want to see how this you know, reacts in real time, or how does it move with the animated parts, and how can it actually function aside from the, the, the 2D mock-up. And so as you can see underneath, he mocked it up in 3D. He was able to uh, put it together, do a little animation, and you know, we can validate this across the art direction team. The character artist has a good idea of how things move. And also, we have a 3D model that we can pass on to the character artist to have a base to start and work from. So when it came to how we were going to uh, start at least showcasing this to the other concept artists within the studio, we had two branches of training that we wanted to do, both of which involved characters for the time being, but we uh, uh, intend to expand to do some environment work as well. Um, the first training that we had uh, initiated was uh, taking a pre-existing character from a game, uh, bringing it into Blender, and uh, skinning, um, rigging, skinning, uh, lighting, posing, everything, to now have a template that the concept artist can then go and paint over, whether it be uh, for a beauty shot or cosmetics or anything that we want to do. It was very quick and iterative. If the art director didn't like a pose, well, it was very easy to change, render out a new template, and continue working. Um, after that, uh, Nicolas Coté, who is very, very good in Blender, um, showcased how he just starts a character from absolutely nothing. And so he gave a class on how he concepts and models in Blender and then brings it into whatever uh, 2D uh, software he's using to paint over. So these were the two main branches that we had done for concept art. And again, we want to emphasize the fact that the artist is free to choose the software that they want to get the results they want. This is just another tool that we want to give our artists because it is a powerful tool. Afterwards, we moved on to the 3D artists in the studio. Um, again, this was already the most proven pipeline. We had already done it on Meet Your Maker, and so we kind of already had an idea of where we wanted to go with the trainings and how we wanted to deploy it across the studio. Um, that being said, we, have, we are a studio that has been around for 30 years now, and uh, all, even though we had already done it, we knew it worked, we still encountered some resistance and difficulties. As you know, when you're used to using something for 15, 20 years, it's kind of hard to say, hey, let's use this new thing. So we had to work it in kind of slowly and softly into the minds of everyone. Uh, and so we decided to do trainings over about a three or four month period, but really, really starting with the basics. And so the basics were open to everyone in the studio, programmers, designers, lighting, anyone who wanted to attend the, the trainings were allowed to. And so basically we went through very much the basics of Blender. So we opened up the software, we went through the viewport, how to bring simple things into the scene, and basically get everyone wanting to try and use Blender. And we had quite a few participants in those first classes. Um, after that, the next stages were uh, some more advanced modeling techniques. These were more catered towards uh, the environment artists, the prop artists, the character artists, and people who use uh, 3D softwares quite more uh, frequently. Um, and so these were more advanced modeling techniques, how we go into edit mode, how we model, using the modifier stack, and trying to get the results we need through more advanced and complex techniques. And lastly, we moved on to uh, much more um, production-ready assets. And this is really much more tailored towards our 3D artists, environment artists. And so this class was how do we go from a concept or nothing to a finished in-game asset. And so, like I mentioned before, we staggered the intervals of these trainings so that uh, individuals can take the learnings, mess around with it, play with it in the production, and then come back to another lesson and learn more. And essentially build up that knowledge base slowly over a period of time instead of just giving all the information in one shot, and then hopefully people you know, adopt it. And again, it was quite, quite uh, well received. And lastly, what lies ahead for us, right? And so as a studio who's been around for a very long time, we do frequently look to updating our pipelines. 
Uh, that being said, we are actively at the moment looking at a character art pipeline. We are building it and looking into it. And what we're seeing after all of these trainings is genuine interest from all of the individuals or artists in the studio who come to us asking, hey, can, can we start using Blender? Can we start getting it into our production? So we are seeing a nice organic uh, want to use Blender within the studio. We have started investigating as well animation and how we can fit it into our pipeline. We've just began, so we're really in the early stages. And now we know as well rigging is next on our list, and <laughs> we will be getting into that very shortly. And also, what lies ahead? Essentially, anything that Blender has to offer, we want to at least explore and see where it can fit into our production pipelines, because it is a very powerful tool. Yep. Thank you. So when it comes to the technical integration itself, there were three main points that we wanted to look into. Uh, Behavior is basically a Maya-centric studio, so we really wanted to look into our current Maya pipeline and see how much of it would need to be ported to Blender. Um, secondly, we actually needed to learn how to develop tools in Blender, because <laughs> again, we had Maya background, so we knew how to code things in Python, but we didn't know the Python API for Blender, so we had to um, schedule and uh, structure the training for that. And lastly, we needed to look into how we would develop our tools and deploy it into the artist's hand and make sure that we can get the right tools in the right people's hands. So uh, when it comes to the pipeline for Maya, um, when we started looking into it, um, we saw how much legacy stuff was around it. And a lot of it was built around fixing or handling very specific Maya things. So very quickly, we knew that we basically wouldn't reuse much of it. <laughs> We'd just start from scratch, because uh, we wanted to leverage all the new Blender stuff uh, and make it a more modern pipeline. Um, so when it comes to deployment, um, there were a lot of scripts that came along with our Maya uh, deployment. Um, in the Blender case, we basically just wanted to bundle a couple add-ons, have the ability to have a startup script that goes along with it to hook everything together. And yeah, so because of that, we didn't need to reuse anything from Maya. Um, the biggest part, though, was the investigation to the current tool stack that we had. Um, again, we've been using Maya for I don't know how many years now, but a very long time. Uh, and our current uh, in-house tool stack had over, I would say, 100 scripts. Um, and we didn't have a proper way, uh, an automated way, I should say, of knowing what was actually used in that tool stack, which was kind of hard to figure out what would need to be ported. Um, so we had to do it the manual way and do a good old survey monkey, send it to the artist, <laughs> and then uh, just get the information and see how much was in use. Um, and out of the hundreds of scripts that we had in our tool stack, there were basically 15 of them that were actually used uh, recently. And out of those 15 scripts, only two of them were critical to our pipeline. So instead of having the first instake of port porting everything over and spending a lot of development time, we decided to just get the critical stuff out, put Blender in people's hands, and see if any needs come, uh, come up, and then try to see if there are existing add-ons that already exist uh, that could fill the needs or if we need to develop stuff on our own. The second part, there's nothing magic around it, but we just needed to learn how to develop tools inside Blender. Again, we're a very small team with uh, primarily Maya uh, knowledge. So again, we know Python. We know how to code. Uh, we knew it would be fairly smooth transition. Uh, but we wanted to structure everything just to make sure that the learning curve would be smooth and we can get the ball rolling as soon as possible. So in our case, it was about uh, getting a, an online course from the, our learning department. Um, going through that, and once we were done with it, it was to, sorry, it was about uh, getting all the free resources online. So the documentations, like the chat rooms, the forums, like everything, there are so many great resources out there that are free. It really helped us like ask questions and get a, a, be a better sense of like some things that we weren't too sure uh, how to approach. Um, and we solidified all of that into a simple project that we just wanted to ship. Uh, in our case, it was just a simple scene cleanup panel UI uh, tool that we made. And uh, it, yeah, every, again, it just helped us solidify all of our uh, learning. When it comes to the tools deployment and accessibility, um, again, uh, we, we had an idea of what we wanted to achieve. And we knew that currently with Maya, there were a lot of moving pieces that were kind of hard to deal with. Um, when we looked into uh, deploying tools for Blender, we basically, uh, yeah, I mean, 
Sorry, I'm just getting lost in my notes. <laughs> uh, luckily for us, the good folks at Blender already worked uh, on the, the extensions platform. And for us, that solved so, much, uh, so many of our issues. Uh, there's a lot of overhead that we didn't need to worry about. Um, we basically just had to uh, link all of the pieces together uh, that we already have, so link the different platforms and hook that into Blender. So in our case, we already were using a Git-based platform to host all of our code. Uh, we already have an internal platform that can serve as a repo uh, that we can point to. And we just made a simple startup script that would point to the repo where all of our tools are being hosted. Um, it was just a very basic uh, workflow that we created, but already it did 90% of the work that we needed. And right now, we're just uh, working on automating uh, the pieces that aren't automated yet. But we know that everything should be uh, fairly simple to set up. Um, and once that was done, everyone was super happy with how it went. Um, and we knew that by using the extensions platform and having the repository system, we sh would also be able to uh, have better control over uh, which tool would be used by which artist. So in the case of like a specific project that uh, is about to deliver a milestone, sometimes they'll want to lock their tool stack so that they don't get any updates that could potentially break uh, the, the delivery. Um, so we know that we could possibly just make a new repo specific to that, uh, that project, and then lock their, uh, their updates, and then have the rest of the studio still get updates from the other repos. Um, so for us, again, it's just a matter of like, making sure that the right tools goes into the right artist's hands. And that's about yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, in closing remarks, um, user engagement in the studio has been absolutely fantastic. We are seeing a nice organic a switch or an organic uh, want to use Blender in the studio, and this is making us quite happy. And of course, the ongoing work in Blender that we are going to continue to do from here on out, as it is a very powerful tool, and we would like to explore it to its full potential within the studio. Uh, that being said, we are not allowed to have a Q&A here, but we'll be right outside the doors if anyone wants to come and have a discussion with us and talk about anything related to Dead by Daylight, integration, Blender. We're here for the rest of the week as well. Thank you. Thank you so much.